to what's new in Operator Framework. Uh, so today, we have myself, I'm Jesus Rodriguez, uh, Principal Software Engineer at Red Hat. I'm the team lead for the Operator SDK team there. And um, with me is Jonathan. Hey, uh, my name is Jonathan Burkhan. I'm an open source software contributor for IBM, uh, maintainer on the SDK, uh, which is what we're here to talk to you about today. So, show of hands, how many of you have heard of the operator framework? Wow, it's more, I'm impressed. Um, what about operator SDK or OLM? Okay, Cube Builder Controller Runtime. Wow, that's great. You guys have, you, have, you surprised me. I honestly was expecting not very many hands, so this is really happy. <laughs> so what is Operator Framework? Um, it's an open source toolkit to help you create and manage your operators. There's two key projects, Operator SDK, which is the CLI. It's an extensible toolkit that can scaffold out your projects and help you create bundles to integrate with OLM. OLM, Operator Lifecycle Manager, um, will help you, it helps you get your install, manage, and upgrade your operators. So basically, it takes away a lot of the hard work and just kind of lets it run and manage it for you. Um, it also has a dependency model as well. SDK, uses other upstream projects, controller tools, cube builder, and controller runtime as well. So what's new? We just recently added Java's based operator support to the operator SDK. So what are Java operators? They're effectively operators that you write in Java. <laughs> Simple as that. So they, we currently have Go and Ansible and Helm support, so now we can actually help you create your operator, scaffold it out in native Java. We were able to do this, there is a uh, new plugin, Java Operators plugin, which integrates with SDK, that does the scaffolding of it. And then there is a Java Operator SDK project that was started by another group that is effectively a controller runtime library like, except written in, in Java. So it allows us to not have to do a lot of the lower level Kubernetes pieces in Java and, and it makes it easier to develop your operator. Um, for the first version of the plugin, we're actually scaffolding out a Quarkus based operator. So, Using Quarkus runtime, it'll make it faster, and it kind of reduces a lot of the code when we actually scaffold it. So why did we do the Java operators? Well, one of the reasons is there were a bunch of Java developers. Everyone says it's the popular enterprise language, so we wanted to kind of target there. We have a mantra of meeting the developers of where they are. So instead of forcing folks to learn Go and write the operator, let's get to them where they feel more comfortable. That's how we got Ansible. So a lot of folks were, hey, I need to get operators written, I need to deploy my stuff, and they already had playbooks and things in Ansible, so we kind of, we went there. And then Helm charts, hey, I've already got a Helm chart and I have to do an operator, can I get started? So we did a Helm operator. This is the same thing. There's been a lot of chatter of folks wanting to be able to write their operators in Java, so this was kind of a likely, um, good candidate and good path to go down. What else? So phase two plugins. So phase two is in Cube Builder. It'll soon be into SDK when we bring in the next release of Cube Builder. So what is a plugin? Wikipedia says it's a software component that adds a specific feature to an existing computer program. That's exactly what the plugins have been doing with Operator SDK. So we have three main methods in it, create API and create API, I mean webhook. So these plugins allow us to extend those features. So when you do in it and you give us the plugin of Go, Ansible, Helm, and now Java, 
we can create the specific plugins that you need, the specific operator project that you need. We also added chaining, you'll see that in the other slide, that allows you to combine plugins during one of these phases. So, phase two. What about the other phases? So phase one is when we introduced the plugin architecture to operator SDK. So this, again, allowed us to go beyond Go and add specific languages and extend the features to it. Um, right now, the phase one plugins are all Go-based. So they have to be compiled into the SDK. They cannot be external. It's all one big thing. 1.5 is when we added the chaining ability. So you could potentially say, I want to initialize Go, and then I want to add, say, OpenShift or um, EKS or something that can maybe transform your project during initialization and do something to it. Um, those are still Go-based only and compiled in. Today, the Java Operators plugin, we wanted to get it out sooner, so it is still Go. But the plan is to merge it, make it into a phase two. So what is phase two? Phase two allows for out-of-tree plugins. So they will no longer have to be compiled into the operator SDK. They don't have, they can be, have their own release cycle. They can be written in any language. We basically have a simple input. We give you a, there's a universe that we pass in. Everything is done right now through standard in and standard out. Um, and we can call your external plugins. We have discovery. So we know to find and where your plugin is and we can run that. In the um, current implementation, there is an example of a Go and a Python to kind of illustrate that you can do this in the future. So again, any language that can handle standard in and standard out and can be made into an executable. But wait, there's even more. Jonathan will take over. Oh, hello, is this thing on? Okay, so. Uh, let's do some more show of hands. Who here has worked on an application that was deployed to Kubernetes via a Helm chart? Okay, so uh, unsurprisingly, most of you are pretty familiar with Helm charts. Uh, who here has tried to make a Helm operator based on those charts? Okay, quite a bit, I don't think I saw, we got one guy back there. Um, so. Currently today, the Helm operator uh, offers pretty limited functionality. Uh, its intent is that it's sort of a stopgap measure. You have something that's deployed via a Helm chart, you'd like to make it an operator. Uh, you can quickly get up and running with a Helm operator, but it offers very limited functionality. Uh, it pretty much is just sort of a one size fits all. Uh, you don't get really any control over the reconciliation of the resource. It just, somebody creates an instance of the CR, it spits out the Helm chart. Uh, so Hybrid Helm is our attempt to sort of alleviate this problem, to add additional functionality to Helm operators. Uh, they're never really going to be as advanced as, a, a, you know, like the Golang operator where you have total control uh, and can do, you know, arbitrary functionality in the reconciliation loop because you're implementing it yourself. Uh, but hopefully this will allow you to uh, get some more life out of those, those Helm operators. Um, so... Basically, rather than right now today when you build a Helm operator, you get everything baked into an image that we control, uh, and it just sort of, you know, you get the image, you can't really control what's going on. Uh, so the hybrid Helm operator, rather than having everything pre-baked into an image we make, it's more similar to the Golang where it's gonna spool out a bunch of scaffolding on your machine, and you can go in and edit the various pieces of it. Um, in addition, we have a couple extra little sort of helper features uh, that allow you to manipulate uh, the operator that's being uh, provisioned in terms of like some Helm abstractions you might be familiar with, uh, like an overrides file or Helm pre and post hooks. But you'll be doing this in Go code uh, to manipulate the, the custom resource type from your operator. Uh, it's a separate repository from SDK for the moment uh, that contains all these helpful uh, helper functions. Uh, and we're gonna go ahead and do a demo of it right now. Um, now I've been having this I've been fighting with this all yesterday because the conference internet is awful. Um, but hopefully my cluster is still up. 
and this should work. Yep. Okay, that's running. Oh, I know what I did that in the wrong. Okay. Let me just copy pasta some commands. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and init a hybrid helm uh, operator. We're gonna use the uh, Bitnami WordPress chart. Uh, it's sort of the hello world of helm. Uh, it's a non-trivial example uh, stands up a WordPress instance that's backed by, uh, I think by the default configuration, it's a MariaDB instance. Uh, and of course this would take forever to run. <sighs> okay, well, oh no, there it goes. Okay, so if you're familiar with what the Go operator looks like, this should look pretty similar. Uh, we've scaffolded out uh, the basic framework, we have a main.go, which is going to run the controller manager. And it's going to have uh, a reconciler that's configured with the helm chart and some pretty basic defaults. Um, and then we're going to go ahead and add the type based on the WordPress chart. Uh, so we can see see what's happening once that spools out. We've got an API directory now. Oh man, this is taking forever. Well, I can go over here and show you what it will look like. Yeah, or maybe not. Okay. So normally I would be able to build and deploy this image, but I've already built the image and uploaded it. So I'm gonna go ahead and deploy it um, just to show you what the basic thing looks like. Hopefully that shouldn't take too long. Okay, so I'm spooling up the controller here. Uh, this is what was built out of that main.go. So if we wanted to, uh, if you're familiar with how the controller manager and the controller tools and controller runtime libraries work, that's the same as the one that runs in the Go operator. And provided you're handy with a little bit of Go, you can go in there and make it do whatever you want. Now it's, it comes pre-configured with the same Helm operator library code that the regular Helm operator uses, but because we have the source code, we can go in there and make it do whatever we want. Uh, okay. So let's go ahead and provision an instance. Oh, this takes forever. Okay, so we have an instance coming up. Uh, like I said, it's got a pod that's basically the WordPress uh, web server backed up by a pod that has a MariaDB instance in it. Uh, hopefully the images should already be cached. So it shouldn't take too long to start. Well, while that's happening, we can go ahead and do the next step. So assuming that comes up, we'll be able to access it. It'll be a very basic uh, uh, WordPress that's got a, a little web page running. Um, Let's go ahead and make it do something fancy. So, like I said, this is the Go code. Uh, if you're all familiar with how controller runtime uh, or controller manager works, uh, this is the same thing. Uh, we're gonna go ahead in and use one of those helper functions I was talking about. Uh, so like I said, we have a, a helper function that lets you set uh, basically the controller uh, tools equivalent of a Helm overrides file. And we're going to go ahead and stick that in here. So I'm just going to create a map that's going to set the WordPress blog name field to the override blog instead of whatever it's set to. Um, and now this is fairly simplistic. I'm just doing you know basic string to string. Uh, but because this is happening in Go code, you could do you know get as fancy as you want here and have override files based on what's going on in the cluster. Uh, 
you know, even spin up a, a, a Go controller tools reconciliation loop and do whatever you want uh, in that. Hopefully this is up, okay. Got to have a little networking magic on the back end so I can see it. Now keep in mind this is the old one, so without the override file. Okay, so we have this nice little blog. It says the hybrid blog. That was that demo I created. So now if we go back here, We undeploy the old version, and like I said previously, I've already got these images compiled and cached on the cluster, so I'm going to go ahead and delete the old one, update my tag. Go ahead and deploy the one with the override file fix. Hopefully that doesn't take too long to come up. There we go. Uh, I got a second demo file. Okay, so. This has the same blog name, the hybrid blog as the, the, the previous one, but because we have that override file that I added to the controller, uh, once this comes up, Uh, we should load the web page and it should have a, the, the override blog name instead. Oh, but it takes forever. <laughs> uh, while that's running, we can take a look at... So the one I use, like I said, uh, is an override function. Uh, we've got a couple other helpful uh, functions in here somewhere. Uh, so there's the override values one. Uh, you can set things like max concurrent reconciles, how often it reconciles, uh, how many releases you want to have on the cluster at a time, annotations, a bunch of other Helm stuff. Um, so even if you're not the handiest with writing your own custom reconciliation loop and go, uh, if, you know, assuming you've already got this thing packaged as a Helm chart, you've probably used some of these abstractions and you can just go ahead and add them to your operator with these, uh, helper functions. Okay. That's up and running. Got to do a little bit more of that. Now, fingers crossed has a different name, even though that wasn't what I declared in the cube YAML. So I used my override. Uh, so that's just a short demo for hybrid Helm. Uh, let's go ahead and keep going. Uh, so that's sort of what we, we have, everything we just mentioned uh, with, I guess, the exception of phase two, but like the Java operator, hybrid Helm, that's all in the release. You can go download that and use it right now today. Uh, now we're going to briefly cover some of the stuff we're working on that's coming in the future. Uh, so for Operator SDK, uh, right now we're working on external bundle validation. Uh, so what is a bundle? Uh, a bundle, if you've ever used OLM, a bundle is the artifact you produce that encapsulates a specific version of your operator to then be consumed and deployed by OLM. Uh, currently, when you generate a bundle, it runs a suite of validations against it, but those validations are entirely opaque because they're compiled into the SDK. Uh, they happen whether you want them to or not, and you can't add additional validations to that. So we're breaking that out. Uh, we're going to allow arbitrary validators to be or validators to be called from arbitrary binaries. Uh, so if you have some custom validation of your operator that you want that's specific to whatever your operator is, uh, you'll be able to add that in. Uh, and also, from an internal perspective, uh, this is going to be a lot better because uh, now validators can be bumped independent of the SDK version. Uh, so previously, which validators got ran was dependent purely on what version of the SDK was installed on your machine. 
uh, which maybe was good, maybe was bad, depending on you know what version match you had between your SDK version and the version that was used on your, to generate your operator. Uh, but this will this will do away with that. Uh, we're going to be adding support for external language plugins. So this is uh, what phase two was talking about. Uh, so uh, like Jesus mentioned, currently today, even like the Java operator is written in Go, which is kind of weird. Um, we're hoping that this will allow the community, like I'm aware of, uh, there's the Java operator, there's also a, a Python framework out there. Uh, but this will allow the community to say if they want a Rust operator framework or a Python or whatever arbitrary language you want, uh, that they'll be able to go and write that and they won't be dependent on us as a, a bottleneck. Uh, OLM has some slightly spicier things in store. Uh, so right now, today, uh, when you install your operator with OLM, it creates this thing called a catalog uh, that's part of how it keeps track of operator versions. Uh, and right now, today, that's stored in an SQLite database, uh, which is kind of hard for a regular human to use, because uh, in order to talk to it, you've got to you know, do SQL queries, and if it, you, know, you miswrite something, you've got to extricate itself from the database. Um, so this is being replaced with just uh, a sort of a file-based catalog, that's what it's called, uh, where this stuff is just going to be stored in plain text YAML, uh, which hopefully should be a lot easier for a human to use, especially because we're all familiar with crudding YAML up and down to use Kubernetes itself. And then also coming down the pike is Ruckpack. Uh, so that's the name they came up with it. Uh, but basically what it is, it's OLM 2.0. So they're going to be doing a major version bump of OLM. So the API is going to be entirely different. Um, it's going to be based more around the concept of the bundle. So right now today, when you need your operator to be usable with OLM, you make this thing called a bundle. Uh, but it's, it's a collection of artifacts and doesn't really have any one-to-one -one correspondence with like actual Kubernetes resources that get created uh, by OLM. Uh, so we're going to be changing that so that the bundle is going to be a Kubernetes type in OLM, uh, and you add bundles just by directly crediting that resource. Um, uh, eventually, we're going to have support for generic bundles. So rather right now today, we're, we have our own one specific bundle format that we create, and you have to you know, use that. Uh, we're hoping to have support for generic bundles, so a bundle can be backed by a multiple different kinds of resources. Uh, we could stick with the bundle type that we have today, uh, or you could like have a, a bundle that's backed by a Helm chart, and that's how your operator is packaged. Uh, so hopefully uh, this will be helpful. Uh, if you don't actually care about that, you just want to keep using OLM, uh, when the upgrade happens, uh, all the commands you use with operator SDK to generate and use bundles today should still work. Everything should happen behind the scenes, so uh, individual users and authors won't have to worry about it. Okay, that's it for what we have prepared. Uh, would anyone have any questions? And I think we got Martin here to run around with the microphone. One, two. Okay. Hello, folks. Um, so has anyone got a question? Just put your hand up and I'll come down with the microphone. So uh, last week I wrote my first uh, Java operator with the Quarkus SDK, it was really great fun. Um, the part I was struggling a bit with was the status implementation. So there are really good examples, et cetera, but I, I was having a bit of a hard time on how to streamline that. So um, there, I think there's the other Go project, Cube Builder, where you had the more or less a, a defined standard saying uh, status changes, uh, for, uh, like last transition message, etc. Are there any plans on standardizing this part as well, or did you deliberately put that yeah, free? Or let that free? The the Java S, um, Java operator SDK library does they are they are attending the queue builder and controller runtime meetings as well, and so what they're trying to do is it's not going to be completely feature parity, but there are common things that happen on the Go and controller runtime side that they try to implement on their side that come up. So as far as a concrete plan of, yes, it will be the same, I can't say that for sure, but they are aware. So I'm sure what's going to happen is they'll look at it and then try to get it as close as possible to that one. Um, the Java meeting is every Thursday at... 11 a.m. Eastern, which I think is 5 p.m. Central European time. So if you ever have a concern, you're more than welcome to join that meeting and, 
and, and bring it up and we can always have a conversation about it as well. So we've no uh, questions yet on the live stream. Um, anyone else? Oh, yeah. Hello everyone. Uh, quick one. Any difference in performance from the Go operator to the Java one? Um, with with Corcus, there we haven't done a full like per performance numbers on it. From what we've seen with Corcus, like startup time, it's a, just a little a hair sh a hair slower than starting native Go. Um, but Corcus in native mode is way faster than starting a JVM. Operator, so that's one of the reasons we targeted Quarkus first, is to allow that to, to get you there faster. So, yeah, Quarkus, Quarkus has surprised me because you know, not not to disparage Java, but at first I was like, well, that's going to be a lot of startup time and everything, and then with, when you put it in native mode, it's really fast. So, uh, okay, anyone else? Anyone else that would like to ask a question? I'm, I'm going to ask a question, actually, um, and it's of interest to me. So I, I was interested to see that you've now gone with uh, this hybrid um, uh, Helm operator. What is your, so I've used the original um, Helm operator where it did just take the Helm charts and it, it did generate the code and you couldn't get at the code. So is this extension uh, or this new hybrid code an ability for if people have the Helm chart and then they want to come on and add ex extra stuff to control afterwards, did you find that people were limited when they had the original one? Say the last part again. So did you find um, users were limited when they had the original Helm uh, operator? Yes. One of, one of the primary reasons for doing the hybrid Helm was a lot of folks would start with the Helm operator and then realize that they wanted to do more and they would often abandon it and go to create a Go operator and um, so that they can have more control. So one of the reasons we did the Helm, the hybrid Helm is to, by default, it generates, it looks just like the old Helm one, but because you have access to the main.go and the actual reconciliation loop, and there's also a library in there, you can now start to extend it and add more features to it and, and get, not have to re-implement your entire operator. So that was the driving factor behind it. I think that's great, yeah. So anyone else, folks, before we finish up? Go on once, twice, three times. So please give a round of applause to our two speakers. Thank you all.